The movie starts with a guy named Charles Farmer in a spacesuit riding his horse around the countryside. When he gets home, the guy finds his wife Audrey made pancakes, but their daughters Sunshine and Stanley are being picky and won't eat them because they say they look like Jupiter with circles on them. Charles wonders where their son, Shepard, is, and Audrey says he's still asleep. So, Charles goes to wake Shepard up in his space-themed room, full of Charles's old pictures. He wakes his son, who has been working on a machine. Shepard tells his dad he got an email from some guy about fuel for their spaceship and wants to meet up. Turns out Charles used to be an Air Force pilot and was training to be an astronaut, but he had to quit to run the family ranch in Texas after his dad passed away. Even though Charles is busy running the family ranch in their small town where everybody knows each other, he hasn't given up on his dream of going to space. He's built a replica of an old rocket and spaceship in his barn. Later, Charles takes his wife to her job at a coffee shop. Some regulars there joke that Charles wants to launch a rocket. They joke that it'll either never happen or it'll explode, but Audrey doesn't pay them any mind. Meanwhile, Charles visits his daughter's class to talk about his spacesuit. Students are excited and ask a lot of questions. But after class, the teacher tells Charles that he's a really good father for not being afraid to look like a clown, for playing dress-up to encourage the kids to activate their imagination. So many parents just resort to dressing up as clowns. You've set a high standard with this costume. Well, I appreciate that. You have a good day. After that, Charles meets up with someone his son talked to online. This person offers to sell them fuel. Charles asks for 10,000 pounds of it, which surprises him. You plan on launching a rocket? Yeah. You're shitting me, right? Oh. Huh. Charles finds out the price and delivery cost of the fuel were expensive. Turns out, Charles doesn't have enough money for it, so he heads goes to the bank to try and get a loan for the fuel he needs. Despite being his old friend, the banker he talks to turns him down. Now, folks right here, they think you're crazy. That rocket ship of yours is amazing. But as a friend, I have to look you in the eye and say that I think it's time you give it a rest. Charles still owes money from before, and if he doesn't pay up soon, the bank might take his farm away. And half of his debts he inherited from his father, along with his ranch. I assume more than half that debt from my dad. And the bank assumes that you're going to pay it back. During dinner at home, his daughters join him in talking about space and saying, prayers for their dreams. Then, he takes his girls into the spacecraft and talks about the stars. Audrey supports her husband in his dream. At night, she notices that Charles lost his wedding ring. He tells her he left it somewhere in the capsule. In the morning, Hal, Audrey's father, visits them. Charles shows him his progress in building the rocket. Hal also supports his son-in-law, but they are interrupted by a mailman who gives Charles a letter from the bank. It says that Charles has 30 days to pay off his debts or lose his house. This makes Charles super mad, so he storms into the bank and throws the letter, wrapped around a brick, right into the office of the loan officer, Arnold. This causes a big scene, and even the sheriff gets involved. Mom, what's up, Chopper? How's your daddy? Waiting for you. You want to ride? That's all right, follow me. They end up going to see a judge. Arnold shows the judge the brick that was thrown at him. The judge tells Charles just to say sorry to the loan officer. Say you're sorry. Arnold, I'm sorry. And asks Arnold to leave them with Charles for a while. Assume the position. You're not really going to whack me with that thing, are you? Come on, knowing you all your life. The judge expresses his concern about Charles's problem, so he orders him to see a psychiatrist suggesting concerns about his behavior and mental well-being. The only psychiatrist in town is Beth Good, Charles's former classmate who works at a school. While waiting his turn, Charles has a small chat with a kid in the waiting room. What'd they get you for? Sleeping in class. How about you? A broken window. The shrink talks to Charles and tells him to forget about his space dreams. She thinks he's got issues from his childhood and needs to grow up. But here's the kicker. She flirts with him while saying all this, which is kind of weird. So after that, Charles goes to Shepard's classroom, interrupting the lesson. I could use an engineer such as yourself at the house. Even though the teacher tries to keep going the history lesson, Charles jumps in and says he's going to teach his kids how to make history themselves. Then, he takes them back home and tells them they're going to be part of his space program. He holds a briefing, informing the kids about their new schedule. Later, Audrey shows up at the house with her colleague Phyllis. She's wondering why the kids aren't at school. Charles tells her not to worry, saying they'll only be out for five weeks and will go back to school after that. Moreover, every morning they're going to hold class and study their regular subjects, so when the kids return to school, they won't be behind. You know what Shepard's science teacher said to him? I mean, get this. She said science isn't sexy. I mean, do you want your girls to grow up only knowing uh, when Mercury's in retrograde? The FBI learned about his attempt to buy a ton of rocket fuel. They come to the farm. 
They find Charlie in the warehouse with Hal and start poking around the whole place. They even find the rocket Charles has been working on. They are amazed by its size. The FBI check out everything on the farm and start thinking maybe Charles isn't planning a space launch after all. They get suspicious, thinking he might be making a warhead instead. Well, how do we know you're not building a warhead? Because I'm not at war. So they decide he can't fly the rocket until they figure everything out. Charles visits his lawyer. They sent the FAA application six months ago with the flight plans and illustrations of the vessel. But Charles never received any reply saying he couldn't launch the rocket. The lawyer says that they didn't think Charles was serious. The lawyer says he has a buddy in Manhattan who specializes in cases like this. The next day, the whole world hears about Charles's story on TV. News coverages in all languages talk about the former Air Force officer who received a degree in aerospace engineering. The lawyer calls him, saying he sent a friend from CNN to protect him from FBI scrutiny. Holy cow, Munchak, you didn't tell me your friend was CNN. Suddenly, Charles is super famous, with people all over the world talking about him. He becomes a national hero to the people. Supermarkets in his town use his name to attract more customers. There's a huge line in front of his barn. People want to see the rocket themselves. Two FBI agents are assigned to monitor Charlie's movements closely. They are worried that with all those TV reporters, they will look like bad guys. We're gonna look like asses. Their discussion is interrupted by a phone call. What is it? My wife. She wants an autograph. Back in his town, folks who used to laugh at Charles's dream now think he's awesome. They're all about supporting him so that the rocket he made can immediately launch and it became the pride of the small town. The rocket is huge. It's really big. Now the FAA realizes that his application wasn't a joke. They are determined to stop him at any cost. The FAA pulls some strings and newspapers start saying mean stuff about Charles and his family, calling them antisocial or even saying they're from outer space. You know, J. Jonah Jameson is always is just J. Jonah Jameson. Audrey says they need to tell everyone that it is not true, but Charles replies that it is better just to show them. So, they all head to a carnival to hang out. The press follows them and film every move. Then, Charles's old buddy from the military, Colonel Masterson, shows up. They all have dinner together, and Colonel Masterson gives props to Audrey for her cooking. He shares his experience when flying the shuttle. They even joke around about what to name Charles's rocket. Everyone comes up with a name, but Charles' worker writes down his version, otra mujer. which means the other woman in Spanish, and they settle on calling it that. After dinner, Charles shows Colonel Masterson the rocket and the control room he's been working on. <laughs> ah, you built this thing? Bolt by bolt. But the colonel is not totally convinced it'll fly. He thinks the FAA won't approve it. The colonel drops a bombshell, though. He says the authorities won't let a regular person go to space and ask him to abandon his dreams. Then he makes Charles an offer, a guaranteed trip to space through official channels, a seat in the shuttle. I say I don't want to hitch a ride on a no, no, bus. Forget that. Forget about hitching a ride on a bus, okay? Charles realizes that the colonel has an order to talk Charles out of launching the rocket. The colonel says the big shots are worried about Charles showing them up with his homemade rockets, which could mess with the trillion-dollar space industry. Nice rocket, though. So, they do everything they can to stop Charles from launching his rocket. They make it super hard for him by giving him a bunch of rules and stuff to follow. The FAA, FBI, CIA, the Department of Energy, and members of the military are assembled to review Charles's application. The officials say they can't let any civilian create such a massive rocket that could be turned into a weapon. You based your design on the Atlas rocket, yes? Yes, sir. Were you aware that the Atlas comes from the design of a ballistic missile? Yes, sir. How do we know that you're not constructing a WMD? Well, because if I was building a weapon of mass destruction, you wouldn't be able to find it. <laughs> At the same time, Audrey gets a visit from a lady from Child Protection Services. She tells Audrey that Charlie's brainwashed her and the kids. He has isolated them from all the outside influence. She says Audrey needs to take charge of her family if she doesn't want to lose her parental rights. Meanwhile, Charlie Charles gives his motivational speech about the importance of having a dream and struggling for it. And if we don't have our dreams, we have nothing. The head of the FAA says they'll inform him about their decision. After the commission, the head of the FAA approaches Charles in a bathroom and threatens him. Right now, the U.S. military has enough firepower pointed at your ranch that if you decide to launch within seconds, your remains will be spread over five states. The lawyer overhears this dialogue and tells Farmer that he was bluffing. They just have no law to stop him yet. So they are just trying to intimidate Charles. I don't know. 
Actually, I think they're pretty good at assassinating people who have dreams. Later, Audrey goes to the grocery store, and it seems like everyone's watching her. A cashier asks her, So is it true? Got a million dollars for your story? I won't tell anyone, really. I've read about it. Vanessa, it's not true. And when she tries to pay, her card gets declined. She has to leave without getting any groceries. Then, Audrey goes to the bank and finds out they're taking away their house and all their farm stuff. That night, things get heated between Audrey and Charlie. She accuses him of hiding his problems and 20 delinquencies. They end up fighting during dinner. The next day, everyone goes to church while Hal and Charles watch a sports car race. I'll tell you one thing. You are one fabulous father. And you know why, Farmer? This man couldn't even get his family to eat dinner together. But you have got your family dreaming together. Hal remarks how they get huge advertisements just to drive those cars in a circle. This gives Charles an idea, so he uses his fame and visits several companies. He tries to convince them to advertise on his rocket, but all of them deny him. They think if the mission fails and he dies, it would bring them a lot of loss and guilt. Later that day, he brings home presents from that very company's. They find Hal dead. Audrey mourns her dad. They bury him peacefully and get back to work soon. One evening, Charles notices a man on his farm who is counting his cattle. Farmer approaches the man and asks what he wants. The man tells him that he's appraising his land for the bank. Charles, using the FAA's tactic, threatens him. You know, I own 352 acres. Did you ever try to find a body on that much land? This evening, Charles comes up with the idea to make his own fuel by mixing kerosene with hydrazine. He asks his son to reset the rocket engine so it can run on the mixed fuel. The lawyer comes to Charles and informs him that the committee wants 60 days to make a ruling. Charles responds that he doesn't have 60 days because the bank's going to foreclose in a week. The lawyer explains that's the FAA's plan to prevent him from launching the rocket. That night, Audrey and Charles have heart-to-heart -heart talk. It turns out his father always dreamed about having a farm. It was the meaning of his life. When he learns that the bank was going to take his farm due to the debts, he committed unthinkable. Charles admits that he feels he might do the same if the FAA takes his dream away. The next morning, Audrey wakes up and reads Charles's farewell letter. Suddenly, there's a huge blast that shatters the windows. She calls for her son, and they both watch the rocket launching. Little did they know, Charles was already in the cockpit, getting ready to take off. The rocket lifts a few meters but then falls back down, sliding horizontally into something. Audrey and the kids jump in the car and rush to rescue Charles, who's badly injured. He almost died from head injuries and other wounds when the capsule got thrown hard from the rocket. They take him to the hospital, and Audrey begs him not to leave them. Now, people aren't interested in Charlie's heroic story anymore, but those two FBI agents still got to stick around to keep an eye on him and his family. The FAA sees this opportunity and tells people so. That's the reason why they can't allow civilians to build their own rockets. After months of recovering, Charlie starts feeling the weight of the failed project. It's tough on him. He asks Audrey to help him take the remains of the rocket to a junkyard. She refuses to do it. Then, Audrey meets her lawyer, who tells her about an inheritance from her late father. It turns out that he had three trust funds for the kids, and pretty decent sum of money in assets and stocks. She heads to the bank, planning to pay off all their debts. Arnie tells her that he can't believe her husband made them all believe he was going off into outer space. Farmer have us all believing he's going off into outer space. How stupid do we look? His words make Audrey change her mind. She takes all her money and gives it to her husband. She motivates him, saying that all their children were growing up with the dream of long launching that rocket. Without the rocket, we're just a dysfunctional family. After a while, the family starts rebuilding the rocket. Charles also trains himself to be ready for space. They finally finish building their dream rocket and name it the Dreamer. Charlie tells his wife that no matter what happens to him, his kids will know that their father didn't give up and he can die happy just knowing that. My dad showed me one thing when he died. He wasn't dying, he was giving up. After a few hours, the FBI hears that Charles is buying fuel again, so the whole police force rushes over to stop him. Meanwhile, he says goodbye to his family. The FBI stops a truck and is surprised to find it's just one of Charles's workers, meant to distract them while the launch happens. Now we look like asses. Charlie gets into the cockpit. I expect you home for dinner. And Shepard, along with his mom and his two little sisters, are in the control room to start the launch. The FBI keeps trying to get to the farm, but before they can, the rocket takes off. Shepard is leading the mission, and everyone in town, including the officials, watches in amazement. Charles successfully launches into space. All his friends are happy to see it. Charlie Farmer, so huge. Including Colonel Masterson. All news coverages are talking about the successful launch. Charles Farmer launched. 
No, he didn't. When Charles is up there, he releases the booster rocket and plans to orbit the Earth nine times. He cries tears of joy at the beautiful sight. But then, the lights go out, and he loses communication with his family, scaring them. Meanwhile, the FAA official holds a press conference denying any rocket launch. Charles's family waits anxiously for him to reconnect. Shepard calculates that if he doesn't fix the electronics, he will run out of oxygen before the capsule enters the atmosphere by its own. Few hours later, Charles sees his wedding ring floating in zero gravity. It gives him a hint as to where the problem is. He finds disconnected cables. Eventually, Charles manages to fix things and gets back in touch with Shepard. After completing the orbits, Shepard sets the coordinates for landing. I think I'm gonna miss the backyard. Don't worry, I'm setting up coordinates for orbit 9 to 10. You don't wanna miss this window for entry. They drive to pick up Charles from where the capsule will land. He safely touches down and gets picked up by his family to head home. The movie ends with a popular American show host interviewing him. You know, most guys I know can't get a Harley out of the wife, okay? How do you, you know what I'm saying? How do you, how do you get the rocket? Among the spectators are the two FBI agents, happily applauding Charles. And I have a question for you guys. How many dreams do you think have been destroyed by bureaucracy and paperwork? Maybe we could have had more talented scientists and entrepreneurs. Anyway, thanks for watching this video. Subscribe to my channel if you enjoyed it, and click on these pictures to watch some other recaps on my channel.